Hello, hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, Andrew. Okay, hi everyone. It's uh, one minute past. Um, wondering if uh, Shazana is on or if we should just get started. All right, maybe we can just get started. Um, it's good to see Arun and Elliot there in the chat already. Um, maybe if you guys are there, I see there's about 12 people on at the moment. If you could just pop in the chat and say hi, let me know uh, maybe where you are. So. Today, um, I'm in Adelaide on Ghana land uh, presenting to you today. So I'm interested to hear where in the world you guys are. And also maybe 
um, you know, what what you do during the day. So are you uh, in the business side um, of APIs? Are you an experienced developer? Are you a junior developer? Are you something in between? I'd love to know, uh, yeah, where you fit in today. It's always hard to do virtual sessions like this because you don't know uh, who everyone is in the audience. So, yeah, keep using that chat function. Um, otherwise, I'll get started. So it is great to be here at, at API, uh, API Days Australia this year. Um, I was lucky enough to dial into the Singapore one earlier this year, and we're going to be at Hong Kong in uh, next month as well. So that's pretty cool. Um, today's session is going to be an introduction to communication APIs, specifically the messaging API from Telstra Dev. Um, and we're going to go through from start to finish today, introducing the value of these kind of APIs with some examples, and then actually showing you how to send your own SMS using our free trial today. So while we're getting started, head over to dev.telstra.com to register now so that you can uh, follow along with me and uh, do, do the workshop. Cool. So I see we've got someone dialing in from sunny Brisbane today. That's great. I was actually living in Queensland up until a few months ago. So it's good to see another Queenslander, Queenslander there. Um, so this session is going to be for, like I said, mainly uh, it's a high level API session. So for business leaders looking to get a bit more credibility um, with their developers by being able to send their own web APIs, um, understand the value of them and articulate the value of them. Or if you're maybe a developer who's just starting out and you want to send some of your first web API calls, then this is going to be for you. If you're a more advanced developer, you might find some of these things interesting too, but it's going to be, like I said, quite high level. So we've already been using the chat feature today, which is great. You can ask questions anytime. I have my colleague from Telstra Dev, Andrew, here on the chat, who's going to help monitor that for me. And we're going to have a Q&A session at the end too. So keep your chats coming through. Let me know how you're finding things, who you are, where you're from. Uh, what you're doing and um, continue asking questions. You're also welcome to jump on Twitter and follow Telstra Dev. I've got the handle here on the screen. Hopefully you can see it. Um, and then there's me at Michelle Timmin here as well. Um, and like I said, because we're virtual, I do want to have a lot of interaction with the audience so I can get a sense of, of who's here today. Um, so yeah, please start posting uh, in the chat as well. Um, cool. Thanks, Andrew, for jumping in. That's If you guys see Andrew in the comment box, you'll know who that is. And hello, Dev Steve as well. Cool. So just a little bit about myself, so you know who's going to be talking to you today. Um, I'm Michelle Howie. I'm what you call a technical evangelist, so spreading the good word about technology, all kinds of technologies. Um, but specifically, uh, I'm really around virtual and augmented reality, robotics, smart cities, Internet of Things, connected transport, and all that. Um, I recently joined Telstra Developer as a developer advocate, so learning along the way with you guys, which is great. Um, but before that, I spent a few years in networks engineering uh, with Telstra's 5G Innovation Center on the Gold Coast. So ask me anything about that as well. And I've just put there that um, the SDG, so the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, for you guys that don't know that, um, I see tech as the enabler to many of the world's biggest challenges. And I also see connectivity and the networks as the enabler for those technologies, which is why I'm here with Telstra and why I'm talking to you guys here today. And I just wanted to set some context because telcos and service providers don't usually come to mind when you think of open API, agile and software driven. And we've got some amazing speakers at API days um, this year, like you know, IBM, Red Hat, really obvious like, tech providers. Um, but when you think of telcos, traditionally it's like mobile phones and home broadband. So um, here at Telstra, we're trying to make sure that our century of network capabilities is continuing to evolve <coughs> in this software defined, machine to machine, big data driven ecosystem that we're in today. And we absolutely heard in the opening keynote from Mike just how important it is for all businesses to, um, not just you know tech companies, but banks and telcos and everything. So Telstra Dev is our developer center that unlocks Telstra's core products and services via APIs and gets them in the hands of developers, kind of like raw ingredients rather than the finished solution, which you're used to getting from a telco. We've also got end-to-end -end IoT solutions, which was great to hear from the opening speakers today, all about IoT, love it. Um, and we've got those solutions in our marketplace um, with the devices. So we sell the physical devices. We've got the network connectivity, of course, which was mentioned this morning as well. The API access, which is important, um, and the dashboards to help make sense of it all. Because one of the key things that Mike said this morning is it's not about you know just giving data and giving uh, stats. It's about drawing insights from those and making them make sense. Um, I also wanted to mention the community. So <clears throat> I'm trying to help understand what the developers uh, you know, uh, using our products for. So we've got some best practices 
that you guys can contribute to. We've got tutorials, kind of like the one we'll go through today, that um, are for beginners and advanced using our APIs. Um, and we're also solving problems um, in the forums as well. So developers, that means that they can get started and test with the raw ingredients on our portal to prototype cheap and quickly, but then ready to scale to an enterprise level. So we've got a small range of APIs that's constantly growing. Um, so for example, we've realized that a lot of devs don't want IoT devices if you can't get the data out of them efficiently. So we've got some Internet of Things APIs that, for example, give you information about the SIM that's in your device, um, the location, and some other stats about the temperature uh, or the speed of your device if it's moving. We've actually got a new API as well for smart spaces, which is more about building insights. So you can register now and get access to the messaging API for free, which is what we'll be using today. All right, so I might just check in with you guys to see if everyone's still following along. Yep, we've got a few more people joining in. Hello, Ali. Um, do let me know in the chat where you guys are and if you're, yep, we've got Joe there too. Let me know um, if you're there, where you're dialing in from, if you're a business leader, if you're an experienced developer, uh, whatnot. But today's challenge, we're going to get our heads around a specific set of APIs that are used for communication. Uh, we're going to practice using those communication APIs for some automation ourselves so you guys can join along with me. And by the end, we'll see some practical ways to make the complex simple with these kind of APIs. So this is not a comprehensive dev workshop. I'll be keeping it very high level, but I'll give you guys some resources so that you can take it to the next level if you like. And again, lots of times for questions at the end. So seeing as you're at API days, hopefully you know API stands for Application Programming Interface, but I'm not going to assume any other knowledge. So APIs are powering pretty much everything, um, and they have a couple of main advantages. So one of the first ones is getting access to data. So I mentioned before that IoT devices are pretty useless if you can't actually extract any data from them. So some of the information might be super important to know, like the location of your shipping containers or the temperature of your commercial fridge as it's carrying fresh produce through Australia. But it's also really important that that information is kept uh, secure and sensitive. Um, so you want to keep that to yourself. But you also want to be able to provide that information to third parties who need it. So, for example, regulators who are going to give you border crossing clearances, they need to know, you know, was it at a safe temperature that whole time, your truck that came you know, across Australia? Did it actually come from where you said it came from? Those might be things that you want to expose to third parties securely via API, but they shouldn't be able to you know, access your entire database of information, like the names of all your truck drivers and stuff like that. So APIs are here to expose the right thing at the right time to the right people. They also allow different apps and services to communicate with each other. So you might have a blog and you're focusing on blog writing and blog publishing, and you want to take on Facebook and LinkedIn publishing functionality without having to understand you know, how those things work, but you can extend the functionality of your system. And while you're extending that functionality, you can focus on your core capability. So in that example, it's blog writing, or it might be you know, logistics and supply chain. It might be you're a farmer. You want to focus on that core capability, not be bothered by the nitty gritty. So in this example with the messaging API, we want you to be able to send a text message in your app without having to build an entire mobile network, right? We've got that sorted. We're hiding the complexity um, with that API, which is great. So there are many communications as a service APIs. Um, there's omnichannel, um, omnichannel that can integrate email, WhatsApp, phone, all those kind of things. Um, but we're just going to focus on messaging today um, just so that we can try it out together because we've got the free trial there. Um, so you use messaging APIs because you can actually just use a few lines of code to be able to send and receive SMS. You know, we sort out the rest of the stuff behind that. Um, and the reason why you want to use that, I'll go through a couple more use cases today. But keep in mind that texts are actually much more likely to be opened than emails, which is one of the key things we'll talk about with a messaging API. So some examples of uses, um, you know, because they have higher read rates, text messages, you might want to use them for more critical alerts. So, for example, things that you know, need real time, uh, need to be addressed in real time. So one of the examples I've seen is with parking meter expiration. So you don't want to get an email that you check two days later that your parking is about to expire. You want that as a text. You get it. You get your phone on loud. You get it straight away. Um, recently, we've had lots of things like government announcements, you know, with um, you know, the federal government and the state governments trying to get lots of people to do certain things at certain times. You might need uh, critical alerts by text message. Or things like a delivery notification. Well, worse is coming to your door in 10 minutes. You want to be able to know that right away. And uh, that alert is really important because it can 
integrate through an API with other real-time dynamic data. So bringing together the messaging API with like GPS, you know, maybe location of the nearest fire to you paired with your current location. You might want to know your order tracking, things like that. So it's not just the API itself in isolation. So again, because, you know, texts are more likely to be read, you use them for reminders as well. Um, you actually can reduce a lot of no-shows for things like doctor's appointments, uh, which is obviously really critical. You don't want no-shows because it means someone's missing out. But if you can actually pair that with scheduling, so two-way communications, uh, if you actually get a reminder, hey, your doctor's appointment's today at 11 a.m., is that okay? Um, please reply yes or no. Oh, I've actually, on my API days today, no, can we reschedule? So that's where that two-way communications um, keeps users in the loop without manual emails or phone calls going back and forth. It's much easier. Another use that makes the most of that high read rate uh, is marketing. So I can have thousands of unread emails, which I do, but I can never read, leave my text on unread, can't handle it. So even those marketing ones get through um, and they can add dynamic links to discounts and surveys, right? Obviously, one-time passwords with security, things like that. We've, we've all had those before. And then any kind of um, messaging chat function um, allows that scalable automation of services when we use it with an API. So I wanted to talk about messaging APIs and show now how simple it is to get started with little to no experience in developing. So to prove that it's not just you know big governments and teams of developers who can utilize these services, APIs are actually becoming more accessible, more democratized, which I think is great. Um, so for example, you know I was organizing a plumber to come to my house and I missed all of their calls. I can't take calls during the workday, right? So they're able to send me texts back and forth, um, which integrate with their you know, booking system. So, you know, I don't think my plumber has a team of software developers because you know, he's quite a small business. He's not an engineer, software engineer himself. He's focusing on his core plumbing business. But with these kind of you know, low code apps from open source um, you know, websites or these APIs, you can actually you know, get things done really easily without having to have you know, a team of developers. So that's only a couple of examples of messaging API. I'd love to hear in the chat from you guys if you have any other ideas for classes of use cases that we could use, you know, messaging APIs for, um, you know, have a little conversation around those. So um, pop them in the chat here. I can see we've got Elliot and Joe also in the chat, which is great. So keep keep those ideas coming. I would love to, to hear from you and how, you know, when you came into the session, what did you think you could use messaging API for? All right. Without further ado, uh, let's show you and follow along at home. So hopefully you have been able to create a developer account already, maybe while I was talking. So if not, head to dev.tosha.com and sign up for your free account. Um, when you have a developer account, you'll get access to the messaging API free trial automatically. So in less than 10 steps, we're gonna be able to send ourselves a text using the API just to show how easy it is to get started. Um, so, after we've created an account, I'm going to show you guys the documentation for the API, which is one of the most important things when you're getting started with APIs is to actually read through as much as you can of the technical documentation that's going to show you how to use it. We're going to use a tool called Postman. Hopefully you guys have used Postman before. It's for like the easiest debugging um, and testing of APIs, which is why I've chosen that one. Um, and then we're going to add in our credentials from our Tasha Dev account into Postman. Uh, authorize um, those credentials, so to make sure that we kind of are allowed to use the APIs that we say we are. We're going to create a virtual mobile number subscription, so actually create that mobile number that we're going to be able to send and receive text from with the API. Um, step seven here, because we're using the free trial of the API, we're limited to how many people we can send to, so we're going to make sure that our number is registered as a, as a recipient, set that number, and then send. All right. So, cool, just jumping back in the chat to see how you guys are going. Looks good, no one's having any issues so far. So I'm gonna to head to Telstra Dev, so you can see, and this is dev.telstra.com, you can see that I've already signed in, got my name there, and uh, got, here we go. Let's check out the messaging API. Got some, oh yeah, here we go. Got some things on Twitter too, if you guys wanna tag us on Twitter. <laughs> While this is loading, cool. All right, so we're in the documentation. And if you'd like to have a look at the Swagger specs or the Open API specs, sorry, as they're now called, uh, you can download these and open them up in a Swagger viewer, but I'm just gonna stay within the documentation here. Um, so as always, you wanna read the introduction to the API. So we're gonna be able to send and receive SMS and MMSs globally using this API, which is cool. Um, and we're gonna have our own dedicated Australian mobile number. So 
that's the cool thing is that um, this API creates a mobile number for you that you can send and receive text from. And I'll show you um, how you can actually make the most of that feature later. Um, yep, so the features, you get a number, of course. Um, you can actually broadcast messages, so you can send to more than one people at once. Um, and this is the one that I like, the alphanumeric ID. So when you get a text from Domino's or MyGov, um, it doesn't say mobile number, it says who they are. So I'm going to skip through all of this and go to getting started. So the best thing about, you know, API documentation and things like this, like I mentioned, we have low code and no code examples where you can actually download an app that someone else has made. So we've had some uh, amazing Telstra developers. We've had uh, some of our um, at some hackathons. We've had some people put together some applications that use the messaging API that you can get started with. Um, we also have um, some software development kit repositories on our GitHub in a couple of different programming languages. So um, today we're just going to use Postman. But if you wanted to actually um, integrate this API into a different app in your language of choice, um, then you can use these repos. If your language of choice is not there, let me know and we'll work on getting that. But first thing I'm going to do is run in Postman. Luckily, I've already got it open. That's me. Um, so when you import that collection, it's going to add everything in here so you can get started with the API. The first thing we're going to do, we actually have to edit our environment up here. So manage environments, we're in the Telstra Messaging API environment. And we have to make sure that our um, client credentials and client ID are in there so that we can actually use the API. So we head back into Telstra Dev. Because I'm logged in, I can go to my apps and keys. That's where you'll find your keys and credentials. I think that's loading. All this Zoom is taking up all my bandwidth. Here we go. Cool. My apps and keys. If I expanded down this free trial API here, you would see my client credentials and client secret, which before today I'd copied and pasted in this environment. So when I go to send the call, it'll have my client ID and client secret already imported there. Let's go ahead and call that. Amazing. Do -do. All right, go away. <laughs> so I've got created my access token. This is going to be available for one hour. So in the next hour, I can send and receive MMS, SMS um, with this token. Now we're going to create the virtual mobile number that we're going to be using to send and receive text with the API. Um, so there's no, nothing, no parameters needed here. Boom, there we go, that's easy. I've got my destination mobile address, which is active for 29 more days that I can send and receive messages from. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is register the, end, the recipients that we can send and receive messages with the free trial to. So this one needs to be edited. I'm just gonna put one number in there for now. I'll put this um, fake number that I preferred earlier. What is it? Okay, so I'm going to register that number. Hopefully that number is still valid. Yep, perfect. And the last thing I'm going to do is send a message. So this is really cool. The cool thing about Postman is that I haven't really done, actually I haven't done any coding yet, right? So I've been able to set up my subscription, set up my virtual number, do all these things just by following the really simple um, documentation for the APIs um, on the website in the... Um, documentation so that was pretty cool so uh, cool. okay i'm going to send it to that number um so one of the other parameters we have here is a notify url um, we're not going to use that today but that's what you would use if you're going to uh, actually be able to receive text messages back so today we're just about sending but i'll give you an example in a second about when you want to receive messages and let's type the body let's say hey everyone in the workshop with Michelle, my face. Let's uh, fingers crossed and see if that worked. So if we have a valid token, we have a valid mobile number to send from, and we're sending to a registered number, this should work. All right, cool, we've got a status 201. We've sent that text message um, to that number. Here's the URL of that message status. So we can actually click here to check um, the status of that message, if it was sent, if it was received, if it was read, if it was not read, that kind of stuff. Um, obviously sending to Australia as an SMS, which is great. So let's check if that actually sent. Here you go. So at 11.42, hey, everyone in the workshop with Michelle, just to make sure that I didn't 
um, you know, fake that. Let's just say, hey, from API days at 11.41 a.m. I don't know, whatever, let's send that. That worked. All right, cool, that one sent. <laughs> oh, thankfully, thankfully that worked. Um, cool, so that's just, that's how you send and receive, that's how you send messages with the messaging API. That took less than 10 steps, probably less than 10 minutes, and that's just sort of explaining how, you know, uh, the API economy is becoming much more accessible, much more democratized. You know, that was absolutely free, everything we just did. Um, so I think the opportunities are really going to expand with what we can do. You know, I mentioned doctors' clinics, plumbers, um, you know, delivery, you know, postage things that use messaging APIs, and it's going to be easier and easier for them to do that. So what you could do next, um, Using just in Postman, you can actually send to multiple recipients. So we can register up to five numbers here on the free trial, broadcast a message to them at once. Um, you can send MMS. So if you've decoded your images or whatever you want to send, you can send those by MMS. And then next, we can actually receive messages and action those or integrate and or integrate the API into your systems. So to understand how that works, I'll just give you a very complex uh, structural engineering diagram that I found. No, I made this. Um, so what we did just then was we were in the Telstra Dev Gateway. We sent a couple of API calls using our virtual mobile number subscription, send the text to a mobile number. Easy. Same way goes opposite way. You can have a mobile number. So it could be a virtual mobile number or someone on the phone, one of your customers or whatnot, to send the text message into that virtual mobile number endpoint and it ends up in the Telstra Dev Gateway. So where I showed you before where we had that notify URL um, parameter here, we can actually set that as kind of like an endpoint where every time a message comes into this gateway, it gets sent to that URL. That URL can be plugged into your apps and your systems, um, and it can pretty much do whatever you want to do with it. So back at Call for Code in 2020, um, developer Steve and I set up an IoT sensor. So one of these little Arduino boards, I don't know if you can see that. Um, so one of these boards, um, we set this up with some environmental sensors, so temperature, humidity, whatnot, um, so that this little device could essentially send you an SMS with the data that you wanted on demand. So if you send in a text uh, asking, hey, little Arduino guy, what's the temperature? Um, we can actually send that answer back to you through a flow that we did. So almost instant, almost instantly. Um, here's a little sneak peek of that flow, and this is kind of, what I was saying is you're taking it to the next level. Again, we put this together, you know, in less than an hour um, with open source, you know, free trial stuff that we put together. Um, so just quickly, the way that it works, this is one example of how you could integrate the messaging API. I had a little Arduino device connected into IBM's um, IoT Watson, um, storing the, the data from the device, so the temperature and humidity at a certain point in time. Um, so that when an SMS came in, so it came into our mobile subscription number, which had a notify URL endpoint attached into this flow, uh, we could actually um, match that response to one of the readings that it had from the sensor. And then it goes through this flow that we essentially just did. So creating a token, um, sending an SMS with the body from the information from the IoT device. Um, so again, this isn't really an advanced tutorial. I would say it's kind of upper beginner intermediate, um, but that's all available actually on, on our GitHub now. So if you go to Michelle Howie GitHub, you'll see um, two examples of this that developer Steve and I put together with the API. So that example there of polling for sensor readings comes under the, essentially the umbrella of environmental monitoring. So you can get IoT sensors in pretty much anything these days, um, in shoes, in water tanks, uh, monitoring things from air quality in your office building, so you can infer productivity and well-being of your staff in that building, to the temperature of your cow in the farm to see if it's about to give birth, so a hotter cow is you know, closer to giving birth, apparently. <laughs> we, we're going to see things like smart grids, microgrids, connecting energy systems, um, using IoT sensors to make sure that's all happening well, not to mention being able to monitor ourselves to the nth degree. It's pretty, there's no limit, I guess, to the things that you can monitor in this amazing creation that is our body. So these environmental monitoring systems could be integrated, for example, into live dashboards. But again, as was in the keynote this morning, those dashboards are kind of useless if you can't draw insights. So if an anom anomaly is censored in that information or a certain threshold is exceeded, 
maybe you want to get a critical alert sent to your mobile. Hey, you know, we've censored that your blood pressure has gone over this amount. You know, check that out. Hey, we've censored that um, your battery storage in your um, solar energy farm has dropped below a certain point. You better get on that or you know, kick in the wind power or something like that. And as these sensors are getting smaller and smaller and cheaper, more available to the masses, you don't need a lot of developer experience. Um, so across every industry, we're seeing amazing things happen with these um, IoT applications. And we monitor the environment to measure what matters, to get data from our things so that we can make sure they're safe, they're efficient, and then we automate those processes. So one example for saving time that I found in a smart city um, is by measuring the fullness level of the bins in a council, for example, so that you only empty the ones that are needed. So that's saving time for the garbage collectors, uh, but it's also uh, saving money as well for the council not having to go around and collect all these bins. And then also the opposite, it might be bins might be getting fuller quicker, um, so it's not creating you know hazards and things like that. And um, so I, like I mentioned, I'm in Adelaide, and I think Adelaide just won some award for being one of the most intelligent livable cities in the world, in the top 10, I think. Um, so we've been doing this for ages. Uh, another example, this one's for, you know, engaging a crowd potentially. So Telstra is already using a Telstra tracker in um, AFL Guernsey. So the guys have them in the back of their shirts um, running around the pitch. We can see things like we're having competitions on who's the fastest player. So we can see the average speed across several games. We can see who runs the most. And then when you pair that in a sort of dashboard like this that has how many possessions they've got, how many scores they've got, and overlay with some um, more contextual information about other players. You have a really rich data set there that's engaging crowds virtually, um, but it can also be great for the coaches. So the coach doesn't need an engineering degree, doesn't need a software development you know, credential to be able to look at this information and draw insights from it. So that's where IoT and APIs are sort of helping democratize this kind of information. So that's IoT and environmental monitoring. If you want to hear more about the Internet of Things, I've actually got a talk on tomorrow, I think it's at 12.50, um, about IoT networks specifically. Um, and then just after that, we're having a round table with IBM um, on more specifically the role that developers have to play in this ecosystem. So if you're more keen on IoT, we've got something for you there tomorrow. All right, so that's pretty much the end um, of the workshop today. So for further reading, um, on Telstra Devs API, messaging API, use cases, customer stories, tutorials, and whatnot. Um, you can check out Telstra Dev and our GitHub as well. So that's where the SDKs are and the sample apps for messaging API. Um, but for some more advanced IoT API tutorials, like the one I inferred to um, with the oops, with the Arduino kit and the sensors that we did um, with Dev Steve, uh, they can be found again in tutorials soon. I'll put that up soon and on my GitHub as well. So I'll be adding some more beginner, intermediate, advanced tutorials with this API um, as we go along. So you can keep up to date with that. And as someone who's sort of fairly recently started out with APIs and IoT, I found it really rewarding and fun um, to be part of this community. So events like this and people like you who are there, out there um, getting together and, and coding out together, it's been really, really fun. Um, so yeah, I encourage if anyone's listening here that's advanced dev, reach out to some more junior devs. If you're new here, I'd love to hear more about what you're working on. Um, we actually also have a community for people who want to stay involved. So the Australian IoT meetup, Oz IoT, uh, which was formerly Melb IoT, but we've made that link here for everyone, even if you're dialing in from overseas somewhere. So we'll post a link in the chat for how um, you can be involved with the Oz IoT community. Um, yeah, so that's that. And the last thing I'll mention is that Telstra Devs are currently doing a call for developers. We actually want to do some voluntary feedback sessions with you um, to understand a bit more about how we can make our API features and our developer portal, I guess, better for everyone. Um, so you can jump in and email me at telstradev at team.telstra.com to be involved with that. We'll post the link to that um, email in the chat as well. So yeah, we want to hear from you. And then of course, stay up to date with the community on Twitter. Um, share your API projects with, with us, with me, specifically anything to do with messaging or IoT, and we might um, feature them on our blog as well. We've got lots of network APIs in our pipeline, so if you're interested in how Telstra is exposing more about our core network services, um, let me know if you have any network features in mind that you're hoping to unlock your APIs so that you can do your work with us more efficiently, 
Um, let me know in the chat right now if you have any requests for APIs that Telsha Dev can expose to make your lives easier. I think, you know, as a telco provider, we just have there's so much internal complexity and, like I said, a century worth of systems in there that you know, we want to get out to make your lives easier. Um, yeah, and of course, post in any questions over the next couple of minutes. I'll be here taking any questions. And before I forget, again, see you tomorrow. Uh, we've got that lightning talk on IoT, the IBM roundtable about developing with IoT and APIs. And of course, at API Days Hong Kong in next month. So we'll have a session a bit on financial services there. So awesome. Um, that's it from me. I might just pop back into the chat to see if anyone has any questions. Um, we've got, yep, thank you, Ali and Andrew, for posting in those links. And dun dun. Yep, awesome. So, developer Steve's put in um, the link to our GitHub to do those IoT um, sensor demos. Um, so, Abish Abhishek said, I want to learn more on IoT. So, first start, uh, thank you for asking. Um, tomorrow, we can, we'll have a talk um, about IoT specifically. Um, and if you have any, I can ask some questions now if you like, if you have any specific questions about IoT, I don't mind. Um, Ahmad asks, do I have a YouTube channel? I actually have three YouTube channels, thank you for asking. One of them is about APIs and things like that, so um, I don't know, Andrew, if you could have a look on um, YouTube for Michelle Howie, you might find three different channels. One of them is about um, my experiences in South Korea, so I did like a little vlog about that. Um, and then the other one was about my travel, but probably the, the API one will be most relevant for you. Um, cool, I see Alex just posted in there um, that it was your first time on the portal. I'm glad to hear that it was easy to understand. I think that's something I've been working on as well, like being quite new to API and, and the developer landscape. I really wanna make things accessible for everyone so that you can come in with you know minimal experience or maybe your experience in something else. Um, I have a lot of friends who are, for example, from a marketing background, and they you know, want to know more about APIs, they're, they're thinking about going back to uni and doing a computer science degree. Um, you know, I'd say, well, if you want something really specific with APIs, there's a community out there that can teach you. You don't need to go back to uni just yet. So yeah, if you're experiencing another part of life and you want to get started with APIs, I want to make sure that that's as easy as possible. Um, so Abhishek, you want to know more about IoT. So if you have any specific questions, okay, here we go. Does I, does this IoT field come under telecommunication engineering? Okay, good point. So I actually did telecommunications engineering at university. Um, to be honest, it's quite broad. You just learn about electronics engineering. Um, so that's to do with these little microcontrollers. So in telecommunications, we learned about, you know, how mobile networks works, how 3G, 4G and we didn't learn about 5G because it's quite new, but um, before before my time. But um, yeah, so telecommunications engineering does include some of these IoT things, but I think it's like, I've just learned so much from the communities that we've been a part of. So, you know, the, the Melbourne IoT meetups or now Oz IoT meetups um, through hackathons that I've been a part of, like Call for Code, um, GovHack, you know, that's sort of where I learned most of this IoT stuff, attending events like this, of course. So. My telecommunications engineering degree does help so that I actually have that foundation, but everything else you just build on top of, you know, as you're going, but it's a good place to start. Okay, what's the API gateway product we are using for Telstra? So I, to answer that question, I think it's Ap Apogee, is that an API gateway? Yeah, I think so. Um, I think, and I can actually find some um, resources that we have posted about Telstra and Apogee on YouTube. Maybe Andrew, there's something else you can find, Telstra and Apogee. <laughs> um, but Jay Krishna, thank you for that question. Maybe did you want to expand on that a bit more? I can answer a bit more. Cool. Oh, Ahmad, great question. What do you say about the future of 5G and all the rumors going about harm from it? That is a big question. I don't have time to get into it today. I will get into it a little bit tomorrow. Um, but pretty much, I think, I would sum it up in saying that the future of 5G is inevitable, in my opinion. Um, just a brief history of networks. 5G stands for the fifth generation of mobile network technologies, right? It's the G stands for its generation. So, you know, the 1G, well, the first generation came out um, when we had phones that were attached to cords and someone realized that they'd rather be on the move and mobile 
not have the cords. That was a first generation. After a while, you know, we're on the phone and too many people had phones. We had to upgrade the network to the second generation. So that's where 2G came in. 2G also brought with it SMS. Um, so for the first time, it's kind of like bringing a phone and a pager together so you can send messages on the go, right? 2G. Then, you know, everyone had phones, lots of people were sending texts. Then the internet came out, right? People had access to the internet. So we had to upgrade, we, as in, you know, Telstra or Postman General, whatever it was at the time, had to upgrade to the third generation, right? So the third generation mobile networks allowed us to get internet on our phones, mobile broadband, right? But at the time, it was really just, you know, scrolling through the news, scrolling through Facebook. It wasn't, you know, rich content. You couldn't do cat memes and videos and stuff like that. So we needed to upgrade to the fourth generation of mobile networks, right? 4G is all about that explosion of data. So lots of video, actually the thing, most thing that we um, like consume on our mobiles is video, right? And then with 4G, some different companies started emerging. So Netflix, for example, was a DVD delivery company before 4G sort of made video streaming possible. So the catalyst for 5G really is IoT. It's the internet of things. It's the billions of devices around the world, it's millions of devices per square kilometre. So 5G is really inevitable if we want the mobile network to be able to cater for that next generation, right? <laughs> so the next generation of mobile networks, 5G. So with 4G is like great for what we've got, but the future of IoT and machine to machine communications and software defined networking and drones and like connected vehicles and smart bins and things like that needs the 5G world. So that's what I say about the future of 5G. It's pretty much like it's just an inevitable thing um, that we're just going to go about our day and hopefully these new technologies are going to emerge and we're not going to have any issues with the mobile network because we've got 5G already. Now, as the part of your question, the rumours going around from harm from it. Um, Telstra has a lot of research that's been done already on the electromagnetic energies and those sort of like contentious topics about 5G. Um, I can actually probably find some links somewhere with all of that stuff. Pretty much my answer is like no, not not harm from it from those sort of things. Um, you know, there's security concerns people talk about, like with separate to you know the radio frequency stuff. The security concerns, concerns. I mean, that's just um, inevitable with having so many devices on the network. You have to have security, like heightened security. So I think that you know everyone's doing the right thing by making sure their cyber security is um, covered first before putting things on the IoT. Um, and Elliot, yes, it was a very sad, sad word world uh, before cat memes. So I didn't really have a 3G phone myself, so I don't remember. But yeah, thank you. Um, cool. So are there any more questions or anyone that wants to, I don't know, have a chat about anything else in particular? Um, otherwise, we're pretty much pretty much done for today. Um, another one from Ahmed, Ahmad, sorry. What's my opinion about cybersecurity as we're putting everything on wireless access? So cybersecurity with your devices needs to be everywhere, right? So you know you can no longer like you know have a lock and key at one part of your device ecosystem. You kind of need to have embedded security on your IoT devices. So um, for example, even these little IoT like Arduino boards, you know, less than a hundred bucks, like just small microcontrollers, they have like inbuilt security certifications on the board, right? That's so important. At the end of the system where your data, so for example, this had temperature sensors attached, attached to it and we had that temperature, the data from the temperature sensors going into a cloud um, platform. So we're using IBM Watson in that example. You have to make sure that it's secure at that end too. So you can't intercept the data from here, you can't intercept the data from here. And then with IoT, there's that network you know, connection in between as well. So that also has to be secure, so you can't intercept you know, your data from there. Um, and that's where um, there's the difference between, um, what do you call it, cellular mobile networks, like standardized mobile networks, and non-standard you know, mobile networks, right? So uh, for example, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, all those unstandardized networks, they're, they're um, open, spec open source spectrum and all that, they can't have the same security uh, guarantees, I guess as the standardized cellular mobile network. So for example, Telstra's Narrowband IoT and Canon One network, they have inbuilt security within the network protocols so that it secures that that part of the link, right? If you've got a secure device, a secure cloud endpoint, 
and an unsecured network, then there's kind of more vulnerabilities in your system, right? So that's fine for like, for example, I have smart lights in my home, but you can use Google Home. I won't say it too loud because she'll turn on um, to turn the lights in my house on and off. That's over Wi-Fi. I don't really care. Someone messes with my system. They can turn my lights on and off. That's just annoying, right? Um, so, but if there's things like your car, right, you want your connected vehicle to be able to break in an emergency, you don't want that to be on over, over an unsecured link so that someone could intercept it and change the signal to make your car do silly things, right? So that's, it's a long way of answering it, but you need to have security at every end of the system, right? Um, cool. So, and Dev Steve just put in a good point um, that this Arduino from the MKR series um, generates, you know, security certifications on the board. Um, what's that point? To help create even more secure connections to the brokers. Yep. There you go. Good point. So cybersecurity, very, 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 very important, especially when you're putting everything on wireless access. Mm -hmm. So Ahmad said something else about cars and how connected cars are scary. I'm just going to say straight up, I'm not a fan of like driverless cars. Um, I like connected transport, connected vehicles, which have, I guess, as with all, you know, automation and connectivity, I'm really, you know, advocate for having human in the loop systems, right? So, for example, a completely autonomous car might have no driver or, yeah, no, no human control and they might be driving here and there and all the other cars are driving here and there. Whereas a connected vehicle, like what we're actually doing some trials in the moment in Ipswich um, in Queensland and previously in Adelaide as well, um, where, you know, there's a sort of dashboard in the car and the driver gets alerted when there's some sort of, you know, uh, hazard coming up, right? So, for example, a pedestrian that's jaywalking, you might use the connected CCTV cameras. You might use a combination of the uh, maybe a Bluetooth beacon in the past in the pedestrian's phone to make your car brake suddenly to say, you know, there's a pedestrian coming, you should stop, right? Making sure that that the car is aware of all of its systems to know that okay, I'm travelling at this velocity right now. If I brake this hard, then the driver will get whiplash, you know, all these kind of things come into a connected vehicle system, which give the human more information to make better decisions, right? Um, and I think that's the same in lots of things. You can talk about mining, industrial, IoT, um, sports, you know, you're never fully giving over the control, but you're using all these connected systems to give you more, um, I guess, real-time information to make better decisions. So I'm an advocate of having people make better decisions. I'm terrified of driving. I hate getting in cars. Cool. Um, all right. I might, I might leave it there. I think we've talked, I, I really enjoyed, you know, going through the messaging API and stuff, but I always enjoy more talking about IoT and emerging tech. So I'm glad that I kind of came up at the end to bring it all together. Um, like I said, look forward to tomorrow's talks on IoT and the IBM uh, roundtable as well that we'll be part of. Um, and also see you at API Days Hong Kong. And thank you again. So you guys, uh, you're a great audience. Thank you for all being in the chat. Um, thanks, Harold. Harold. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Andrew, again. Thank you so much, Andrew, my colleague from Telstra Dev, for being on the chat and helping um, with the links and everything. So, yeah, that's it for me. I might uh, stop my share. If I can. Yep, stop my share. Um, give you guys all the wave. Give you a chance to take a screenshot of me and post it. No, just kidding. Um, cool. And I'll, I'm going to go join the other talks. So thanks again. And I look forward uh, to hearing from you. Oh, maybe one more thing is a reminder to... Um, email me if you do want to be part of this developer portal experience and feedback. You don't have to have used Telstra Dev before. Any developers we want to hear from, um, yeah, that's me. Okay. Thank you and uh, enjoy API days. Thank you, Andrew.